Dr. Ali and Dr. Cruz come down um, to answer uh, any questions that uh, the audience may have. Any, anyone have a question? If not, if not, I get to pepper them with questions for a while. All right, I guess I'll start off. So Dr. Ali, um, how do you think about the role of drug antibody conjugates um, for patients in the setting of metastatic lobular cancer? That's a fantastic question. So I didn't go into that, mostly in the interest of time. I think when I think of antibody drug conjugates, I um, currently don't think about those in terms of histology, but I think about those in terms of the hormone marker status because we have obviously two antibody drug conjugates, uh, sasituzumab govotecan and uh, trastuzumab druxtecan, and they both have now approval for you know, those HR-positive patients, HER2-low patients, and I think the, the outstanding question remains, how do we sequence them? Um, I think the, the, the short answer is um, that both the drugs are active in all these patients, but I think when you look at the the subgroup analyses of these studies, um, the patients that were HR negative, uh, those were more clearly studied in the ASCENT study. Uh, there were about 50 of those patients that were triple negative, and they were truly in the second line setting in the, ASCENT, in the ASCENT trial. And when you compare that data to the DESTINY-04 study, um, the HR negative patients, there, there were again about 50 of those. But we have to remember that was not a primary endpoint. So even though there is activity there, I think for HR negatives, perhaps the data is slightly more robust for sasituzumab before uh, trastuzumab druxtecan. That being said, I think both the drugs are active. Um, I think when you look at HR positive patients, I do think that the patients on the DESTINY trial were in the one to two media, median prior lines and the tropic study patients were a lot more heavily pretreated. So perhaps it's almost the flip for me for the HR positive patients. I don't know what your thoughts are. Yeah. It's really challenging. I think having a, an assessment of recurrence is probably the most frustrating part of this for patients and providers. Um, and tools are getting better. I think our CT DNA capabilities are getting stronger. Obviously, you heard from Dr. Elaner that the scans are getting better, but none of this is really ready for prime time for patients with early stage breast cancer and lobular cancer specifically. So I still don't have scheduled surveillance scans or labs for my patients with lobular cancer, um, but we do take a very active symptom management approach. So um, my patients will know that I have this two-week guideline. If you have symptoms that we can't explain and if they're definitely in organs that we worry about for breast cancer um, and those unique ones you heard about for lobular, that I want to know about it. And then we'll make a decision about should we get targeted blood work, should we get targeted scans. Um, I don't know about you, Azka, but I find that in the first couple of years after diagnosis, my patients usually end up with some kind of scan at least once a year yeah. um, for a symptom-directed complaint, but we're not doing those just if everything else is okay. And then the late recurrences are tough. I tend to see my patients in survivorship beyond the five-year mark if they have lobular cancer maybe twice a year instead of once a year to check in on these symptoms um, and really take seriously if there are vague things like, you know, nausea, GERD, maybe sending them for early endoscopy, worrying about GI luminal involvement, uh, where I might not worry about that for a patient with ductal cancer. Perfect. Um, and Dr. Ali, um, how do you think about endocrine resistance in terms of kind of when to start considering that for your patients and kind of the process for workup and decision making? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for assuming for lobular breast cancer, we're talking majority of the, these are ER positive, about 95% of these. Um, you know, we get a lot of information from the time the patients spend on that first line, you know, estrogen, uh, uh, endocrine therapy plus CDK4-6 inhibitors, similar to what we saw in the phase three emerald study as, an, as a reference. 
Um, I think patients that get, we think, 12 months or longer, they are behaving more like endocrine-sensitive patients. And I think those are the ones that really are going to gain some benefit from the benefits that we've seen from the PI3K kinase studies, from the AKT inhibitors, and some of the other novel targets. I think, unfortunately, patients that are kind of blowing through that first line CDK4-6 inhibitor, which are really truly are some of the more active drugs, those are the ones I worry about endocrine resistance. And I think those are the ones I start looking for targeted agents and perhaps chemo and you know antibody drug conjugates. Yeah, and I would just add that these are patients where I think the sequential use of NGS or next generation sequencing is really, really helpful. Um, these patients often have disease that's hard to get at with biopsies, but circulating DNA um, in the form of liquid biopsies can be tremendously helpful to think about these targeted agents and just see, you know, maybe if you can put a finger on why the cancer is progressing at the time that it yeah. is based on the mutational profile. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Cruz and Dr. Ali.